What's going on, everyone? I'm Travis Brown with the Eagle here inside the uh, Eagle newsroom. But over there, that guy's in California. That's Nick Starkle back again for another week to break down uh, what Texas A&M has been doing on the football field. Nick, how's it going? Uh, how did uh, Corona Del Mar, the team that you're the passing game coordinator, how'd they do this week? Oh, well, I'm doing great. I'm doing great uh, because it's been a couple of days since our game. Uh, I was frustrated, definitely <laughs> licking some wounds uh, over the weekend, trying to figure out where we went wrong, what we could have done better. But we lost a tough one. Um, guys fought really hard. So we're proud of those guys. Just, you know, need a little bit more execution. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, the, the the people who are licking their wounds after this weekend is – Arkansas's offensive line and KJ Jefferson a little bit because Aggies got in there and, and sacked him uh, seven times. It's 14 sacks in two games. It, it's just a stark contrast from where the defense was against Miami several weeks ago. I know you were able to look a little bit at what this A&M uh, defensive front is doing. Wh why have they been so successful in the last two games, especially getting to and getting getting the quarterback down? Yeah, so uh, basically just looking at their defense and, and from a quarterback's perspective, you know, a lot of QBs start off and they look, okay, who are the guys that I'm going to have to worry about on the D line? And when you're looking at Texas A&M's defensive line, and it's it's not a knock on them, but it's hard to pick out just one guy that you're saying, okay, we got to slide the protection to him. We got to make sure we get a hat on him. It's really all of those guys. And it's not necessarily the talent that they're playing with, but it's their hustle and their finish. I mean, you watch these sacks that are happening, and it's not just one guy getting to the ball and taking down a quarterback. It's two, sometimes even three guys jumping on a pile and getting in there. They are playing relentless defense. And some guy gets tired, boom, they pop another guy in there, and, and they're just able to continue to rush that passer and just create havoc in that pocket. Uh, one of the really big things that I noticed is that even when they have a three-man or four-man rush, they're very, very sound in their coverage on the back end. And so you got to tip your hats also to the defensive backs, linebackers that are back in coverage that are creating basically coverage sacks, and the defensive line is just finishing the play for them. I mean, when you're a quarterback and you drop back there and your first, second, third reads open, those D linemen are breathing down your neck. And so it works off of each other. Defensive backs, they're getting great coverage. They're covering those receivers. Defensive line is continuing to eat up front. And then you've got defensive linemen who are twisting, coming off of stunts, working off of each other. You know, when they've got, um, we talked about it, you know, you've got a man side and a zone side of a blocking scheme. When you're on that man side of that scheme, your defensive coordinator dials up a twist with the defensive end, the defensive tackle. One of those guys is going to get free. And then all of a sudden that O line is now at a disadvantage and you've got a free runner coming at the quarterback. Um, Another thing that I noticed that I thought was really impressive and actually I was just watching it, you end up getting a pick six off of it, is if that defensive line does not get there in time, they are so quick to get their hands up. And a tip ball is a pick ball. As a quarterback, you're always told, hey, tips and overthrows are going to be interceptions, so you might as well start playing free safety after that happens. And we sure enough, we saw that in the Arkansas game. And uh, – I was thinking about this, um, and, and I <clears throat> I don't want to you know speak for the defensive line, but um, losing Coach Price this past off season, you know he was a coach that I had. He he helped recruit me. Um, the intensity that they're playing with, I think, is honoring Coach Price and the legacy that that he had not only as a player but as a coach, a mentor, as a father figure to a lot of these guys at defensive, you know, at the defensive end, the defensive line position. Um, and, and so I'm just so proud of these guys. I mean, to have that adversity in the off season and I, I can't even imagine the emotional turmoil and just, just everything that's going on with that. And to me, it looks like these guys got together and they said, look, we are going to play our asses off, you know, no, <laughs> don't, don't want to uh, offend anyone, but, but, but they really are playing with their hair on fire. And, and I think that they're honoring Coach Price with that. And so my hat's off to them. And I absolutely love watching those guys get after a quarterback. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to a little bit of the X's and O's, but you bring up a good point there. And I uh, want to th give you a chance to, to throw out there, what are some of your uh, favorite Coach Price memories? 
Oh, okay. So every single year, I'm trying to get invited to the D line cookout. <laughs> okay. I, every single year, I'm like, hey, Coach Price, if you got any extra, you know, I like to eat too. <laughs> and so I think my favorite memory was, uh, was one year he actually brought some back for the quarterbacks. And uh, I got to see that he truly is a grill master. And every year I'm seeing the videos of the D linemen. They're going over. They're they're getting all the brisket, all the smoked sausage, everything. And I'm like, oh, like if I was just 45 pounds heavier and a lot quicker <laughs> off the ball, maybe I could have been invited <laughs> to that cookout. You, you're just putting on but, weight to get to the cookout. Exactly. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. maybe was, put a hand in the ground as a tight end and then make the transition to DN <laughs> by my fifth year, sixth year. It's the reverse Max Wright. Um, exactly. So, so exactly. Uh, what was the best thing you ate? Do you remember? Oh, geez. It was probably the brisket, honestly. Yeah. Like, you can't go wrong with brisket. And so, uh, you know, I, I just remember always seeing him around um, the field. And no matter, like, who you were, it was like, hey, quarterback. What's going on, quarterback? <laughs> it, was just, it was just so great. I mean, I'm injured. I'm on the sideline or something. And I could always count on him to bring my spirits up. And that's just the type of man that he was. Um, you know, he was truly a light in that locker room and a light in that coaching staff. Of course, of course. So back to the the pass rush strategy. You know, a, a lot of talk early in the season about is DJ Dirk and the defensive coordinator being aggressive enough, uh, bringing more guys than just uh, three or four? I know you looked a little bit the last two games. Would you classify the game plan as aggressive, or was it more that the, the guys in the front were just doing their job e exceptionally well? Right. I think that uh, most defensive coordinators, when they hit a certain point on the field, so as an offense, uh, your scouting report goes, okay, you've got your base down. So that's, you know, starting the drive. You're on your own 20, first and 10. Uh, you're on your own 25, first and 10, second and short, kind of those type of things. Those are your base downs. Uh, most defensive coordinators are going to have an identity for that. Um, with, with Coach Durkin, it's not a lot of blitzes and man coverage behind it. it it's mainly a lot of just, hey, let's play a sound coverage and, and let the rush kind of work. Um, you know, a lot of run during that. So you want to be sound defensively. You don't just want to send everybody at once. But then you get to a certain point in the field where maybe it's you're in field goal territory. You're on the 30-yard line now. And a defensive coordinator can make a decision. Am I going to be aggressive here and possibly knock them now out of field goal range? Or am I going to stay back and just kind of bend, don't break? I think that Coach Durkin has honestly come up with a good game plan to not only get after the quarterback, but have some sound coverage behind it. You know, you're seeing some blitzes with some zone coverage, which – it's scary, but if your defense is sound, you've got your guys with their eyes in the right place. Coach Fisher says it all the time, see a little, see a lot, see a lot, see nothing. I think that you're seeing defensive backs with their eyes exactly on their right keys, so they're able to cover while they're still blitzing six guys or they're, they're sending a, a fifth you know, guy off the edge, being able to create these unique pressures as well as be sound behind it in the coverage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so – uh, going into this Alabama game, it's an Alabama team that's given up uh, a, a lot of sacks this year. A&M has come in with a lot of sacks. Uh, what is it about uh, that matchup that could be so intriguing this week, especially with a, a guy like um, a Milrow, quarterback, who is a little dual threat and can get around a little bit? H how, as a defensive coordinator, I know you're not one, but how, how do you kind of game plan for knowing that you have maybe a little bit of advantage there? Yeah, as a as a defensive coordinator, I think that I'm trying to send my four rushers, just four, as much as I can, but create free hitters off of that. And so we're going to do twists. We're going to send the defensive tackle in front of the end, and the end's going to scoop around. Or we're going to send both the nose and the tackle and swoop that end. You know, they call that a long stick, where now the defensive end isn't just switching with the tackle, but he's going all the way to the A-gap, switching with the nose guard. And so I'm going to create some of those opportunities to get our defensive linemen to be free hitters up the middle. I think the, the hardest thing for uh, – a defense playing a quarterback that is as dynamic in the run game as Jalen Milrow is, is letting the interior D linemen get pushed to the outside and not being able to fill up that gap. 
uh, this past weekend against Mississippi State, you saw Jalen Milrow do that. I mean, he drops back, and he ends up taking off down the middle. And when you've got a quarterback running down the middle, they just get – I mean, they get north and south super fast, and it's really hard to rally and tackle. What you saw against Arkansas and what, what A&M's defense was doing was they were creating pressure up the middle. Even if they were only rushing three – they were still creating a wall almost that KJ would have to then run around. And when you get a quarterback running laterally, now it's a lot easier to go pursue towards the football. You've got that sideline to work with to kind of push a quarterback to the sideline, and they've got to make a decision. Are they going to cut back? Because when they do cut back, well, now that D-line's chasing them down, and that's some big guys that are hitting you. And so as a quarterback, you feel a lot more comfortable just being able to step up and go now versus – Oh, man, I've got a wall in front of me. I've got to now get around them. And now I'm eliminating half of the field that I can throw to. And I've got all those guys now pursuing me. And so I think the biggest thing is if Jalen Monroe does get out of the pocket, make sure he's getting outside and he's not just knifing it right down the middle against your defense. Yeah, and and you've mentioned it several times throughout this. Jimbo Fisher uh, in the press conference yesterday was talking about it's not necessarily from a defensive coordinator's perspective about being aggressive or not aggressive. It's how you affect the quarterback, whether that's uh, sending a blitzer, whether that's uh, decoying a blitzer and, and pulling him back or uh, changing coverages. Uh, define that a little bit, if you could. Um, what affecting the quarterback is in different ways other than just sending blitzes um, and, and how a quarterback can be affected by the different things that defenses can do uh, in a, I know that's broad, but in a Reader's Digest uh, uh, right. version. Right. So as a quarterback, every single play you have your pre-snap look. So you're looking at the defense. Um, usually you're looking at a boundary safety or what we call the boundary triangle. You're looking at a boundary safety, the boundary corner, and the boundary outside backer. So the reason that we look at that is because those are the three guys that are going to probably move the most that will tell you what the coverage is. A field corner is, we always call our corners our liars. So a field corner could start off and they could be pressed up on that wide receiver. But then by the snap, they can bail because it's so far away. They could bail out of that thing and what you saw pre-snap was a complete lie, and they're not running that defense actually over there to the field. The guy that can't lie is that boundary safety. So boundary safety, imagine you've got a safety on the hash, and his responsibility for that play is a deep third in the middle. He's going to have to start creeping over there right before the snap in order to play a middle-of-the-field high safety. And so Safeties can't lie to you because they just have so, they have so much ground to cover that not a lot of guys are, are physically talented enough to start the snap on the hash and push all the way to cover the other slot receiver on the other side. So taking a look at your boundary triangle, if I'm a defensive coordinator and I'm playing Jalen Milrose, I'm giving him a pre-snap look that is completely different than the post-snap. I'm going to make him digest and try to interpret what a defense is doing after he looks down to catch that snap. So I'm going to give him something pre-snap. Maybe it looks like a cover two. Maybe it looks like it's cover one man. And then as soon as that ball is snapped, I'm spinning those safeties or I'm dropping a corner out and I'm changing that coverage. And, and I'm getting into something that was not the look in a pre-snap. And so sometimes that looks like, okay, I look like I'm getting two guys off of the left side. I go down to take the snap. All of a sudden they bail and now I'm getting two off the right. I think that that's how you affect a quarterback um, like Jalen Milrose, is, is you make him really, really think about what's going on and change that picture of his, like what that picture that you take in your mind pre-snap versus what the coverage is post-snap. So I believe it was 2019 you got a shot at Alabama when you were at Arkansas. Uh, I, we went in and talked to all the players, and it, it, it happens every year with every team across the SEC, with every media uh, uh, core. They go in and say, "Hey, it's Alabama week. Is that is this is this something? Is this is this bigger? Is this how you, how do you prepare?" And the answer is always, "It's the same. We think about it. It's the same. Nameless, faceless opponents." From a guy who has faced Alabama and been in Alabama week multiple times. Is it as nameless and faceless as it seems? And I, I know that's the, the the goal, but but what does Alabama week look and feel like from the practice field inside the locker room? Okay, so it starts off with the scouting report meeting. And when you get your scouting report meetings, what they'll do is they'll introduce the whole defense, uh, kind of philosophy, the schemes, uh, their base coverages, their base blitzes, 
third down, red zone, all that type of stuff. Uh, but the biggest the biggest thing that that I always took away was they would have basically a picture of the defense and it would have circles with their numbers and then their name, height, weight, class underneath it. And those would be color coded. And so you'd have green, which was a good player, yellow or orange, which was, hey, he's a returning starter. Guy can play a little bit. Red was, okay, hey, this guy's a freshman. We don't really know what he is. He's kind of a liability. And then we had gold. And gold was, okay, this guy is probably a first rounder, um, one of the most talented guys in the country. And multiple years, sure enough, you pull up that uh, that scouting report for Alabama and everyone is either a green or a gold. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it's a little bit intimidating. You're like, okay, uh, they've got a – Future first rounder at three technique. They've got a future first rounder at nose guard. Um, all of their DBs are returning starters who are leading the country right now. And their linebacker, yeah, he's young, but he's currently leading the SEC in tackles. And you're like, all right. And so right off the bat, you're kind of thinking, okay, this is uh, this is going to be a tough challenge. And, and and every week in the SEC, I mean, you see players that are going to be you know future first rounders, whether it's at one position or another, but you don't typically see them just all over that scouting report. And so it's it's a little bit intimidating when you first get that scouting report. Then you start watching the film, and you can see a difference. The way those guys get off of the ball, you know, their first step, no wasted movements. You're seeing coverages pre-snap, and then they're getting to something else post-snap. Or you're seeing a coverage where you're like, oh, hey, this play that these guys are running against them should totally work. But it doesn't work because they've got some athletes that even though they're, you know, liable based on the the call or the defensive coverage, they're physically talented enough to say, yeah, hey, we will lock you up one on one and leave that safety in what's not a great position, but he's going to make a play. And so sometimes it's a little it's a little like discouraging almost watching some of that film because you realize, man, the, the best way to get these guys is, is a true one on one matchup where it's hey your guy versus their guy and so you know i remember at arkansas that was that was our game plan was hey let's find our best matchup that we can and that was Traylon burks on their linebackers or their nickelbacker and we're gonna let him eat and we're gonna run guys off and we're gonna let Traylon burks eat I mean, he's a true freshman at the time but we knew the talent that he had at arkansas and and sure enough we go out there and, and i think it was the first third down or the second third down uh, we ran two guys on vertical routes and we had Traylon on an option and we're thinking, okay, he's going to get one-on-one -on -one coverage. Well, Alabama has a good game plan as well and they double covered him. <laughs> and so now you've got to go to your second best matchup, which is against their best DB. Or you go to your third best matchup. So now you're kind of going down, you know, not a guy that you're typically going to say is going to win every one-on-one -on -one ball and it's their second best DB Oh, and by the way, he's also that DB is going to be a first round pick this next year. And so it's it, it's it's about choosing your one on ones wisely and then finding them when they are in zone coverage, finding ways to get guys open. And uh, I remember, I think it was 2018 uh, when Coach Fisher was at his first year at A&M, we were playing at Alabama and we had a a great game plan. Like I absolutely loved our game plan. We were getting a little bit more zone coverage and we got into a two tight end personnel set and we ended up running a, a corner and a post by the two tight ends that were kind of right stacked on top of each other. And the whole week we knew, okay, if we get this coverage, this will torch them. And sure enough, we get down there, get the correct coverage. We end up hitting, I'm pretty sure we hit Jay Sternberger right over the middle for a touchdown and those are the type of plays where if the moment is too big or if you have been thinking like, oh, it's Alabama, like I don't really know what to do, you miss those throws and now the game's out of hand. And so I think it's about, hey, let our game plan work, establish the run a little bit, get them into some zone coverages and then allow these play callers to to dial up, you know, the proper play. And uh, you, you can't beat yourself when you play Alabama. You don't want it to ever be – I got to make a hero play. I've got to, you know, I've got to do something out of the ordinary. 
you, all you've got to do is go in there and execute your game plan and, and bring that thing to the fourth quarter, and then it's anybody's game. So coming into this game, I mean, the spread is, I, I believe it's uh, like two and a half points in Alabama's favor. A&M and Alabama are the only teams in the SEC West who haven't had a loss. Everyone else has is, is had a loss. I, I know in your time in the SEC, it was never that wide open, but but do you as a player – look around and kind of see what's going on in the West to, to know that like if you're in A&M's case right now, this could be the de facto SEC West title game. Yeah, um, definitely. And I, I know you got to take it one week at a time. And that was always my, you know, my MO as a player was, okay, I'm just going to take this one week at a time. This is the most important game. This is the most important play that we're running right now. I'm not worried about what's down the road. But when you do have that free time, I mean, you think about those things and and the implications of it. I mean, we always wanted to play an SC championship game and, and, and we never got there. And so this is that next step for these guys. And, you know, if they can handle this one, it's not a handle this one and we're in, but it's hey, let's handle this task this week, and I think we're really going to like where we're at if we do. Um, and, and so I think it's a great opportunity. I don't think that it's just completely off of the guys' minds, but they're going to take this week like it is the most important week, and 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 that's just how Jimbo operates. You know, His method of, of win it stands for what's important now. What's the most important thing right now? Winning this game. We'll figure out the SC Championship when we get there, but right now it's about – this game right here. Yeah. Nick, thanks so much again for giving us some time. Who do the uh, Sea Kings have this week? Sea Kings have Fountain Valley High School in Huntington Beach, and uh, we're excited. Another home game for uh, or a uh, return to home for us. We've been on the road for like a month, and so <laughs> we're trying to get our groove back in the home stadium. There you go. There you go. That's Nick Starkle, former Texas A&M quarterback, Arkansas, San Jose State. Uh, just just college football extraordinaire all over the place. Uh, he's here every week. We'll talk to him again next week. Thanks so much uh, for watching, and be sure to check theeagle.com for all of our coverage leading up to that big game against Alabama this weekend.